I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. Today, the message, the title is In Over Your Head. If you would join me as we speak to God first. God, as we come before you, we thank you for your love, your blessing, and God, for your care that permeates us in every moment of our life. We ask that you would take the words that are spoken today, that God, you would direct them, that they would hit the mark, that they would be received uh, to each one in, in exactly the perfect way, uh, that they are yours. And we just praise you for what you are doing in our lives. We thank you for today. In Christ's name, amen. You know, as we continue this week with the theme of restoration, it's kind of a loose theme that will follow us uh, through the month of June, and today is the next section in there. But the question in over your head, have you ever experienced being up against the wall? And I, these are little phrases, I think each one will know. Uh, you feel like there's nowhere to turn. You feel closed in. Things are just constantly moving. I, I know I use the analogy of sometimes feeling like I'm in a vice and someone beyond my control is twisting the vice and it just keeps squeezing. Um, you know, maybe you're working on a project and it just isn't coming together. You're fighting, you're battling it. Nothing seems to work. Uh, you may get one piece to work and something else comes apart. And you're just, you're at wit's end. Maybe it's a relationship that's on the rocks and you, you can't fix it. You hurt for the restoration. Maybe it's in the family. Maybe it's a friend, a neighbor, a coworker. But that relationship is just, it causes you a lot of angst. And you can't seem to overcome it. Maybe it's with someone that is no longer here and you would love to go back and change the words that you, you talked about last. Everything sometimes seems to be going wrong. I use the phrase, the, the wheels keep falling off the wagon. Is this an exaggeration? Has, am I the only one that maybe has experienced this, that things just sometimes don't work well and it's it's tough it's hard what do you do what things do you do what's your response and i know that we're not in a position right now where we open the mics and everybody shares a response but i want you to think about what your response is is it anger frustration an empty feeling maybe you just feel lost there's there's no uh, positive thing out of what is going on you keep trying you keep trying and you keep trying is this your approach the approach you take you know the the phrase doing the same thing over and over expecting different results have you got caught up in that i know i have and it's, it's frustrating because the results seem to always be not a positive. Maybe a deadline is, you know, the, uh, a deadline is coming and, and your stress level is going up because you are under this, this time frame to achieve whatever it is, whether it's work related and, and usually that's where it's at or in school. Uh, but what does that do to your body as that, as that deadline approaches? And you know that it's not, you're not going to make it. It's, it's not achievable for you. Does your blood pressure go up? 
and that is a very real thing. Eating disorders, addictions. Your health suffers because of that stress level that you've got this, this line and you can't seem to make it work. Do you feel like a failure? What is the solution? Quit, I'm done. Is that the solution? Is that really what the best answer is? I don't think so. Uh, you still have to eat, you still have to live, you still have to function. And if you just quit, everything crashes. We're gonna go to Romans chapter five, verses one through eight today. This is a segment that we'll be going through uh, most of the scripture today, and certainly the verses one through eight. Uh, I'll be reading from the Passion Translation, and there will be a number of places that I interject commentary from uh, a book on Romans by John Stott. We're going to begin in verse one, and this section of one through eight is called Our New Life. Verse one, our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us. And he now declares us flawless in his eyes. This means we can now enjoy true and lasting peace with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus, the anointed one, has done for us. I wanna pick a, a few of these words or phrases, peace with God. That's a reconciled relationship with God. That relationship is reconciled with that faith that we have in Christ. And it's done to us through our faith. That righteousness is there. And he declares us flawless, without fault, without error. He sees perfection in us because of him. Jesus does not, nor does he ever see us as a failure. Even when the deadline comes and passes, even when we make poor choices, he never sees us as a failure. Do you, when you're in the midst of that, recognize that the God of the universe and Jesus Christ never sees you as that failure. And then in verse two, our faith guarantees us permanent access into this marvelous kindness that has given us a perfect relationship with God. What an incredible joy bursts forth within us when we are keeping on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. Now, the marvelous kindness here in other translations is translated grace. And in from Stott's book, grace is normally God's free and unmerited favor, his undeserved, unsolicited, and unconditional love. And I think we would all recognize that as a definition of grace. But in verse 2, as he uh, looks into this, is more about our privileged position of acceptance of God. And I think certainly in the last week, we have been educated uh, more than we maybe care to on what the word privileged may mean. God has placed us in this privileged position of acceptance. That's a special place. This is a special gift. And we think of grace beyond just undeserved, unsolicited, and unconditional love, but to be in a privileged position of acceptance. You think, well, where do I fit in that? Romans 8, 38 talks about nothing can separate us from God's love. That's where he puts us. And we we'll, he never stops loving. 
you have permanent access to God's glory. And God's glory is our future inheritance. Know and remember that in God's glory, our future inheritance, it'll come up later in a few verses. And then verse three, but that's not all. Even in times of trouble, you know, suffering, maybe some afflictions, we have joyful confidence, knowing that our pressures will develop in us patient endurance. And patience, endurance will refine our character, and proven character leads us back to hope. Hope of God's glory, hope of our future inheritance. God will never let us down. His love will never give up on us. And we, this is not new knowledge. This is not new words. I know the men's uh, small group have just finished going through Romans and talked about some of this. But the death of Jesus Christ and what he has done and is doing in our lives through and by the Holy Spirit is something that it's easy to say, yes, I know, but then not really think to the level and the depth of what that is. The magnitude of being in a privileged position of acceptance by God. Suffering, you know, as it talks about in the beginning of this verse, even in times of trouble, the suffering or affliction, suffering leads to maturity. Suffering can be productive if we respond to it positively and not with anger or bitter, bitterness. And so that's where we can catch ourselves sometimes when things aren't going well and we're struggling. Do we look to God or do we become bitter or angry or frustrated? Suffering, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Going through suffering is not an easy thing. It's not fun. But if it's character producing in a positive manner, then that is something that God is, is, helps us through. Without suffering, there would be nothing to endure. Times of trouble, failure, weakness, ready to quit, we have a joyful confidence leading us to endurance. But if we don't have anything to suffer, how do we endure? How do we learn what endurance is? This is all part of the process of life. Jesus Christ suffered everything for us. There is nothing in any part that he didn't go through for us and set us in a special privileged place. In verse 5, and this hope is not a disappointing fantasy. Have you thought about, as you read this, you think, is this really real? Is it true? Can I rely? Is this what? I believe, or is it a fantasy? But it's not, and it's not disappointing because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Going back to John Stotts, the Holy Spirit is God's gift to all believers. It's given at our conversion. We received the Holy Spirit. And in the last couple of months, we've talked about what it is to have the Holy Spirit. Especially on Pentecost, we mentioned the coming of the power of the Holy Spirit upon us. But it, listen to this. The Holy Spirit pours God's love into our hearts. Not the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, 
but of the pouring of God's love by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is moving God into our life. We get to experience that because of uh, that whole process. And in verse 6, For when the time was right, the anointed one came and died to demonstrate his love for sinners who were entirely helpless, weak, and powerless to save themselves. Pretty much that describes mankind. He came to demonstrate his love. The essence of loving is giving. Have you ever thought of that? When you love, you give. And God loves us and he does give to us. Again, going back to the commentary, the degree of love in this section is measured partly by the costliness of the gift to the giver and partly by the worthiness or unworthiness of the beneficiary. The more the gift cost the giver, the more that the giver had to pay or it cost, and the less receptive the recipient deserves it, the greater the love seems to be. You know, I, I was thinking about that. Someone that is in a, a very wealthy position and they spend a tremendous amount for a gift to someone that has no clue it's coming and is not deserving of it. The value of the gift is, is huge because one the recipient didn't deserve it, but they got it anyway. And that's where, where we are as humans, as a benefactor of the blessing of Jesus Christ, the gift. God gave everything to those who deserved nothing. And that's us. And when you, we read that God gave everything, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. That's as high a gift as you could ever even consider or think about giving your one and only child so that all of mankind can have a future. Verse 7, now who of us would dare to die for the sake of a wicked person? We can all understand if someone was willing to die for a truly noble person. But Christ proved God's passionate love for us by dying in our place while we were still lost and ungodly. We didn't do anything to deserve that. We didn't do anything to cause that, create it, or allow it or make it to happen. We just get to receive the gift of Christ coming to this earth for us. Jesus died for us in the midst of our messy lives. Where, wherever we are in our brokenness, he died for us. He calls us to him. That's the call that we received and we, we have responded. We are redeemed in him. In Jesus. I was reading this and I really like this phrase. Jesus didn't come to fix us. Do you ever think of that? Jesus did not come to fix humanity. He came to exchange our broken life for a new life in him. We don't get a repaired life. We get a new life. We don't get one that is just patched up or duct taped together. We get a new life in Christ. What a blessing it is to think of 
that, to have that new life, that new blessing, that love that is so powerful from Jesus and the plan that has put us all there. The restoration process was done for us before we even realized with the love of Jesus coming and dying, resurrecting, sending the spirit back to connect us directly with the triune God. That's who we are. That's the life we have, the power of living a new life. Today, here at Grace Communion in Derby, we love. We love to share life with Jesus. We love to live these verses, to understand what it is to be loved. Our mission is to provide welcoming environments and to learn and live the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the new life that we have in him, the love that we have in him. We praise God for his love for all. Are you excited with this news? Is it something that You've read uh, so many times that it is just kind of there. I, I ask you to think about this week, what that is to be loved by the God of the universe, who has made every opportunity for us, who has exchanged our lives for a new life in him. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach us at Grace Communion Derby on our website or follow us or connect with us on our Grace Communion Derby uh, Facebook page. It is a blessing to, to know that we can share life with one another, to have God's love in our life. Even those days that are a challenge, even the days that the deadline comes and we're struggling or we're facing all kinds of adversity, but that we realize can give us the opportunity to grow in character and be used by Jesus Christ. Thank you for recognizing and listening. And I, I, I ask that you would read the balance of this section in Romans. Hear what God is saying to you. Thank you, God, for the blessing of life. And God, it's, some days it's, it's a real challenge. Some days it is difficult to even get out of bed. But God, we thank you. I thank you for your love, for your blessing. And we ask that you would just be mindful and watchful for each one. In Christ's name, amen.